Well, in some ways, the mask is inconveniently necessary, but necessary it is, and we appreciate um, your cooperation in that regard. And uh, we will not let uh, the fact of the mask deter us from the issues at hand. Again, we're grateful for your uh, presence this morning, and we look forward to our speaker of the hour, Mike Green, who I have known for many years. I've tried to count them up, and I just don't know what the answer is. It's been a long, long time, almost 20, I suppose, as we think about this now. But he uh, serves as the minister of the Cawson Street Congregation in Hope, Hopewell, Virginia, where he's been since uh, 2017. Uh, before moving to Virginia, he worked with churches in Florida, Colorado, Washington, and Kentucky. One of the unique things about Mike is that he is evangelistic and, in fact, was involved in at least one church plant in the state of Washington. He is a 2008 graduate of the Bear Valley Bible Institute of Denver, Colorado. He also holds a master's degree in New Testament studies from Ambridge University, and he and his wife, Natalie, have been married for 20 years, and they have six children. And it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce to you our speaker, Mike Green, who will be speaking to us about John 2, verses 1 through 11, the signs turning water to wine. And I invite your attention to what he will be saying. Good morning, everyone. It's so good to see you. It's always special when somebody comes out on a Monday morning to spend some time with you, right? I appreciate so much those kind words of Mark. I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to be here this morning, to be invited to be a part of the lectureship this year. Uh, before I get into my words this morning, I want to take the opportunity to uh, thank Mark and thank his son, Will. And as Mark said, I've known them for a good long time. I appreciate Will and his leadership of the Bible school here. I think very fondly of my time back at Bear Valley. I see one of my friends, Luke Guthrie, sitting here, and I can think back to our time and what God has done since then. But uh, I appreciate Mark and his, his wife, Lee, as well. They have given me food and given me a bed to sleep more times than I can count. And their kindness will never be forgotten in this life. And I appreciate them so much. Open your Bible to John chapter 2, if you would, please, this morning. John, the second chapter. As we begin a series of lessons, as I understand, on the signs in the Gospel of John. In case you're curious, I'm using the New American Standard Bible as I preach and as we work in the text this morning. John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. The Word of God reads, On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing 20 or 30 gallons each. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. And when the head waiter tasted the water which had become wine and did not know where it had come from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of his signs... Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Would you pray with me? 
Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Father, you have created us and you knew what we would need even before we spoke a word. Father, to you be all glory and honor and praise now and forevermore. Our Father, we come to this portion of scripture this morning. And this is our prayer that we might see, that we might listen, that we might learn, and that we might grow. And Father, that we might be bold as we teach your word, that we might see the fields white for harvest. And that you might open hearts that are ready to receive the truth. Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so as one friend of mine said one time, the burials and the marials, right? That's kind of one of the works of, of preachers that, you know, the public doesn't see in its entirety. It's one of the very intimate aspects of the work of a minister, the, the marriages we perform and the funerals that we perform. And from our unique position, those of us who have been in those roles understand what I'm talking about. You know, oftentimes we will see things that others do not. Sometimes those are very sad things that we see in people's moments of grief. Other times they're very touching or very, you know, poignant moments that we see. But if we're honest, oftentimes we see some very humorous things too. And as I was preparing this lesson, I thought back to the, the last wedding that I performed. It was in a pecan grove in southeastern Virginia. And I guess if, depending on how far south of the Mason-Dixon line you are, a pecan grove, right? For some of you. And as I was going through the wedding, everything was going good so far. And this young man and this young woman are beginning to, to say their words and say their vows. And as I often do, I, I led into a prayer for this couple. And it's like as I was praying for their marriage, something happened in the one or two minutes that I was praying for these folks. He was transfigured before my sight. Because as I came out of that prayer, he was as white as a ghost. And I don't mean it in a good way. <laughs> and I began to look around the audience because a lot of members of our congregation were there. And quite a few of them are in the medical profession looking for a nurse. Because I think this young man is about to hit the ground. And the only person I lock eyes on, Mark, is his mother. And she mouths to me, do something. <laughs> do something. And so I leaned over and put my hand on his shoulder and I said, now listen here, just smile. And he forced a smile. I said, just unlock your knees. And he unlocked his knees. I said, take a few deep breaths. He took a few deep breaths. And then I saw the color start to come back into his skin, you know. Crisis averted, right? You know, nobody else said anything about it after the wedding. The rest of the wedding went on. They, they put the rings on the fingers. They said the vows. But I knew what about, was about to happen. I knew that we almost had a crisis in this wedding. And I'll tell couples as I go through marriage counseling, you know, plan for stuff to happen. Nothing always goes the way that you anticipate it. Things are going to happen. So plan for problems. And then when they come up, just roll with it. But nobody wants bad things to happen on their special day. And you know, as, as special as weddings still are, and I guess to a certain degree, they're a little less special in our modern times than they were maybe a generation or so ago. That's sad to say, but that's just the way that it is. In antiquity, in the day of Jesus, a wedding was a big deal. And they would spend an entire week and they would put this couple that was being married at the center of attention. And they would parade them around town and they would treat them like a king and a queen for a week. A wedding was a big deal in Jewish culture. And so as much as we don't want bad things to happen in, in our own weddings, in our own time, they were infinitely more special in the way that they were treated in the time of of Jesus. A wedding for them was something that was worth celebrating. It was something that this new couple, as I said, would be put at the center of attention. It may be one of the most prominent moments in their entire lives. As we begin the Gospel of John, and really all four Gospels do this, we see Jesus is in the region of Galilee. And if you're picturing the map of Israel, Galilee's that area that's to the west of the Sea of Galilee. You've got those towns that we read about in the Gospels in it. 
Towns like Nazareth, towns like Capernaum, and then also towns like Cana, which was really just around the corner from Nazareth where Jesus grew up. And Jesus and his disciples in our text that we just read a few moments ago have been invited to a wedding. And there was a problem. The text merely states the problem in verse 3 as the wine ran out. And as Jesus' mother Mary comes to him, she states it this way, they have no more wine. And the first thing that I want you to understand is from this particular text that that would have been a big deal. You know, running out of wine would have been a big deal at this wedding that was supposed to be a very significant occasion. And wine represented in this culture, it represented in these events, prominence. It represented opulence. It represented the best that life has to offer. It was intended to bring joy. In fact, the Old Testament speaks to it. And when you read the words of the rabbis that were contemporaries of Jesus, and we'll look at a couple of those in just a minute. They would refer to texts like Psalm 104, verses 14 and 15, which says, He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and the vegetation for the labor of man, so that he may bring forth food from the earth. And here it is, wine which makes man's heart glad, so that he may make his face glisten with oil, and food which sustains man's heart. And so wine represented the significance of the event. It represented the opulence, the, the giving the moment, the occasion, the prominence that it was due. This young couple that are being joined into this very significant relationship of marriage. And I'd always heard a statement from the rabbis that, that came from, I think it comes from the Mishnah. And they said, you know, where there is no wine, there is no joy. And I don't think from our modern understanding we need to read into that. There's, there's no connotation of drinking to excess. There's no connotation of drunkenness in that comment. Rather, it goes back to what I was saying just a few moments ago. It represented significance. And the fact that the wine would run out was embarrassing. It represented catastrophe. It represented a disgrace on the family that was there. I want to go to a couple of these passages from uh, the Mishnah to just kind of make the point as to how significant wine was and this event was. And this comes from, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce the tractate because it would make me sound like some highfalutin guy, and I'm certainly not that. Or I'll either sound like I'm the guy from West Virginia, and I certainly am that. So I'm just going to tell you that this comes from the Mishnah, tractate 109. And it says this, the sages taught, a man is obligated to gladden his children and the members of his household on a festival. And it's stated, and you shall rejoice on your festival, you and your son and your daughter and your manservant and your maidservant and the Levite and the stranger and the fatherless. And it goes on in this text to talk about it. How do you make them rejoice? Give them wine and make them joyful is how it says. But it goes on in the next couple of paragraphs. If you read down through here, this is one rabbi giving his instructions. And I got to be honest. Can, can we just, I know it's Monday morning about 830. But can we find some humor in this particular tractate from the Mishnah? Rabbi Yehuda says one should enable each member of his household to rejoice with an item that pleases them. Men with what is fit for them and women with what is fit for them. Rabbi Yehuda elaborates Men with what is fit for them, with wine. And as for women, what should one cause them to rejoice? One should let them delight with, and I changed my format so it cuts it off, with clothes. At least one person found that funny. I mean, come on, is there, it, there's never a truer statement than what Solomon said. There is nothing new under the sun, right? What's going to make the men happy? Give them something to drink. What's going to make the women happy? Give them shopping. What I thought was even funnier is, if you back up one more tractate in 108, they go so far as to say, now make sure you put the kids to bed and bring food for them. I just thought that was humorous. It's like this Jewish checklist, Mark. You know, how do you have a good festival or a good ceremony? 
Food for the kids, drink for the men, and clothes for the women. It's good. Now, I'm telling you all of these things in part because I found it humorous. And, you know, why laugh alone, right? Bring it for somebody else to get a good laugh out of it. But it shows you with those rabbis that were contemporary to Jesus just how how prominent these things were, including wine in that ceremony. It, It represented the opulence and the significance of the event. And so there's two things of note now. Having given some historical background from some outside texts, let's work in the text itself for a little bit. There's two things of note from the text as we begin to look at it. First of all, Mary was aware that the wine had run out. Now, given everything that I just told you, that wouldn't have been something that you would have just told everybody, right? You don't run around when the wine ran out, given how significant it was and how embarrassing it could have been, and say, the wine is out, everybody go home now. No, I think Mary knew the couple that was getting married. I I believe, and the text doesn't state this specifically, but she was somehow aware of that. And the second thing, Mary believed Jesus could do something about it. Not only was she aware of the fact that the wine ran out, but she believed that Jesus could do something about it. And so we come to Jesus' response to his mother. And, you know, I read through a lot of commentaries and they spend way too much time looking at his comment where he says, woman, what has this to do with us? As if it was some sort of disrespectful comment or some slight on Jesus's part. I have no notion, brethren, that Jesus was in any kind of way disrespectful to his mother here. In fact, I find the comment very intimate, just like when he says the same thing thing to his mother on the cross. But what is significant is the words of Jesus. Where Jesus makes the point at the end of his comment and he says, my hour has not yet come. Now that begins a series of comments and phrases where that exact phrase, my hour has not yet come, or some some version of that is going to occur in the gospel of John. And it's going to work in a sequence all the way up to a time in which it says the hour had come. Let me show you just real quick. John chapter 4 and verse 23, when Jesus is talking to the woman at the well and he walks her through this conversion experience and she gets down and she's asking questions about worship and he says, woman, an hour is coming when neither in Jerusalem nor in this mountain will people worship. And then he goes and says that an hour is coming and is when you will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Then in the very next chapter, Jesus is addressing the topic of the resurrection. And he says, an hour is coming in which all who are in the grave will hear the voice of the Son of Man and live. An hour is coming. And then in John chapter 7 and verse 30, and then in John chapter 8 and verse 20, the people want to seize Jesus in Jerusalem when he's there. But it says they were unable to do so because his hour had not yet come. And I see in that God's providence working in some way to prevent him from being snatched up by the people at that particular time. But here's the one that you want to look at. Open your Bible to John 12 for just a second. Okay. This is the one that you want to see. John chapter 12. So when Jesus makes the comment to his mother, my hour has not yet come. He has a particular hour in mind, a particular moment that's in mind. And all of this works forward, as I've just briefly demonstrated in the Gospel of John, up to this moment. John chapter 12, beginning in verse 20, says, now there were some Greeks among those who were going to worship at the feast. These then came to Philip, who was at Bethsaida of Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and Andrew Philip, and he came and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them saying, watch it now, here it is. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Jump over to chapter 13 in case we need clarification as to what that hour is. He clarifies Chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The hour of Jesus' suffering had come. The hour for him to go to the cross had come. And everything has been building up to this point. Now this is a second point to this 
Uh, This isn't even in my sermon really this morning. But when I was reading through this, just thinking about what prompted Jesus to make that comment. It was when the Greeks looked for him. When the Greeks wanted to see Jesus. When the people of the world were seeking him out, it was time for the gospel to go to the whole world and it was time for him to go to the cross. You know, on another note, real practically speaking here, isn't this what we need to be praying for? For folks today? That's what I want. That's what it's going to take to turn this world around, right? That's what revival looks like. When people start saying, we want to see Jesus. And that's what I want to see. I want to see people coming and saying, we want to see Jesus. Jesus. But Jesus tells his mother there, my hour had not yet come there in that wedding feast in Cana of Galilee. Indicating that he was on a timeline, indicating he was doing everything in a very particular way. And yet, his mother tells him, or tells his servants rather, to do whatever he tells you to do. And Jesus, nevertheless, acquiesces his mother's request. There are two things that we see that happen in the text of John chapter 2, if you want to flip back over there, if you're still over in chapter 12. There are two things that happen after this. The first is that we see that there is these stone water pots that were used for the Jewish custom of purification. And they could have contained as much as 180 gallons of wine. That's a lot of wine and that's a lot of money. And so when Jesus takes and fills these stone water pots with this wine, it was a very generous and a very costly gift. But the second thing that we see is the head waiter, the one who would have been in charge of basically distributing the drinks and the food and such in this event has no clue where this wine came from. Only thing that he knows is, this is the good stuff. This is the best stuff. It was not according to custom to serve the best wine at the end. You gave everybody the best wine at the beginning, and then you gave them the more watered down stuff at the end after everybody has had their fill and drank what they wanted to. And perhaps what John is wanting us to see in this particular text, in these two events, is a contrast between the new and the old. Between the old of the Jewish purification rituals of the religious establishment and the new wine that Jesus brought. After all, isn't that what Jesus, he used the... New wine illustration himself in Luke chapter 5, 38 and 39, didn't he? Where he said, you don't put new wine into old wine skins because the old wine skins will burst, right? You put new wine into new wine skins. And, and he used that as an analogy of his ministry, his teaching, and the commandments that he was bringing in contrast to the oldness of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the stale form of religion that they were known for. But secondly, I think there's a contrast here. The better wine comes last. Just as Jesus came in the last in the order of prophets, here he comes bringing the best at the last. And I really think this is what ties this section into the next section where Jesus goes in and he clears out the temple. What is Jesus doing when he uh, clears out the temple there in the very next section? He's saying something new is here. Get this old stuff out of the temple, this old way of doing this, which isn't pleasing to my father. And I think there's a connection between those two here. But lastly, in our text, as we've been working through it this morning, we come to the key verse in the text. And I think the key verse is found in verse 11. And let's read it again together. It says, this, the beginning of his signs, Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. His disciples believed in him. Now, if you take that key verse in our section that we've been asked to, to work through this morning, I think you can break it down into three distinct parts. The first is this comment, the beginning of his signs. Now, this is the first of these miracles, which John is using the word sign and not miracle on purpose, I believe. 
This is the first of these miracles which point to a deeper meaning. Now, I'm going to pull something up for you real quick, and I've got to tell you something funny. I wanted to show this illustration to my kids. And my daughter, who's 13, came into the room, and she goes, Oh, no. You're not diagramming sentences, are you? That's just the worst. She said, Nobody likes to diagram sentences. And then my son, who's 11, almost 12, comes in and goes, Yeah, sentence diagramming is the worst. I said, I like diagramming sentences. It makes sense to me. I didn't ask you. I just wanted you to see the cool illustration at the end of my sentence diagramming. Anyway, I owe this illustration to Brother Stafford North, who went to his reward in this past year. Because when he was teaching the book of Revelation, he did this real simple illustration. And I couldn't help but think about it as it applies to the signs in the gospel of John. He would take his arm and he would say, all right, in the book of Revelation, you got to look at it this way. This is what it says, but this is what it means. Okay, this is what it says, but this is what it means. Well, when we look at the signs in the gospel of John, this is what it says. He turned water into wine. But what does it mean? In other words, what does it teach us about Jesus? What is the significance of the sign and what does it teach us about Jesus? See, that's why I wanted to show it to the kids. That little, let's see it again real quick. You ready? I wanted to just show this to the kids. You see how that did? I said, wasn't, and they didn't even care about that. They just wanted to, they just wanted to pick on me about the diagramming of sentences, I tell you. Kids will keep you humble, Mark. Kids will keep you humble. But does that make sense to you this morning? When you're looking at these signs, these distinct signs that we see, you see the sign, but what does it mean? What is it teaching us about Jesus? That's the point. What is it telling us about the Lord? And we've got to study it for those deeper understandings of those signs. What does it mean? And so John tells us this is the beginning of his signs. And then he's going to go throughout the gospel of John or throughout the gospel that he writes. And he's going to give us signs. He's going to turn water to wine. He's going to turn a little boy's lunch into a meal. He's going to raise someone from the dead. And each of these signs is going to have a deeper meaning. But secondly, if we keep through going through this text, it says that he manifested his glory. And that word manifested carries with it the idea, according to Arndt Gingrich, the idea of publicly made known. He publicly made known his glory. This was the first time that those people saw it and they became amazed and saw his glory. Like John chapter 1 and verse 14, right? And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. But the third thing in this key verse that we see is the idea that his disciples believed in him. And I'm sure that this verse is going to get quoted some 50 times throughout the course of this lectureship, and rightly so, because it's the purpose statement of the book, John chapter 20, 30 and 31. Many other signs Jesus performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but here it is. But these have been written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you might have life in his name. So John gives us these signs so that we might believe. But again, believing is more than just a mental assent and acknowledgement of Jesus. It's grasping the deeper meaning behind the signs and applying them to our lives. And so speaking of application, let's spend the rest of our time in our lesson this morning making application to our text and its implications for our lives. And I have four of them that I want to leave you with, and then the message will be yours this morning. Number one, going back to what I was just saying, what does it mean to believe in Jesus? You know, at least part of the answer, I think, as we think about that question, as we study through the Gospel of John, has to include grasping the deeper meaning behind those signs. 
And as John records this account, he wants us to see the significance of these moments where he and others realized that Jesus was more than meets the eye. Now remember, this is John writing his gospel at the end of his life. And he's thinking back and he's, it's like he's remembering and he's saying, this is the moment that he, I realized that he's more than just a teacher. He's more than just a rabbi. And these signs indicated that. And so believing means that we must see Jesus. This process of seeing him for who he is and his relation to the world. And to lead others to Jesus is a process of helping them see Jesus more clearly. A good example of that will be found in John chapter 4. Where Jesus walks the Samaritan woman through this process of seeing him more clearly. Clearly, in John chapter 6 and verse 26, Jesus is going to tell the people, you didn't follow me. You're not following me because of the signs. That is to say, because you saw the signs and you were reaching for the deeper meaning. You're just simply following me because of a meal, because I fed your stomachs. And so we have to ask ourselves the question, what does it really mean to believe in Jesus? And I got to be honest with you, brethren. I think this is one of the ironic things about some folks that I see who are Christians over an extended period of time. They will, they will go many, many years, sometimes decades of time, believing in Jesus and yet never reaching for the deeper aspects of his relationship. It's like they will, they will be content to exist in a very shallow state of spirituality and relationship with Jesus. And yet John is challenging us in this gospel, beginning in chapter 2, but going really throughout the gospel, all the way to the purpose statement, to go deeper, to really grasp what it means to believe in Jesus, in all of its fullness, to come to an understanding of who He is and how He relates to us in that meaning to our lives. Secondly, when the wine runs out. That was the problem in the text that we looked at this morning, right? There came a point in which the wine ran out. And what did we say the wine represents in this text? Do you remember? It represented opulence. It represented the best that life has to offer. And don't you know that there comes a time in which even the best that life has to offer doesn't satisfy you know, I've lived long enough on this earth and I've been in ministry long enough and I've seen and experienced enough to see what happens when the wine runs out. I've seen teenagers who have given up on life. I've seen young adults whose path suddenly diverted in a way that they didn't want it to go and, and they just gave up. I've seen people who are middle-aged that experience what they sometimes call an identity crisis. I've seen older folks whose failing bodies led them to despair. And I think the point here is Jesus is better than even the best that life has to offer. Because the reality is, and this is what we need to help people see, at some point, the wine runs out. You know, one of my favorite authors, and this person is just an enigma to me. He's such an interesting individual is Mark Twain. And his, his book, The Old Man and the Sea, was given to me by my wife as a gift. And I love it. I can just sit down and read it on an afternoon. And I didn't know this until much later in my life that he actually committed suicide in a cabin in Idaho. This man who had had all of these experiences. And if you read his biography, it's absolutely amazing the things that he experienced. And at some point, the wine ran out. You know, the message that we see with Jesus is that even the best of life cannot satisfy. But with Jesus, as Paul would say, even though our outer bodies are decaying, our inner man is being renewed day by day. David would mention it in the psalm, Psalm 92, 12 through 14. And you think about Psalm 1 and verse 3, like that tree that's planted by the streams of water. The one who trusts in the Lord seems to continue to grow and grow and grow and grow. You know, one of the, the 
man, this is one of those things I wish I could just get everybody to see, get folks in the world to see. And I know that some of you have experienced this. You've seen that person, that older brother or sister in the church, and as they're aging and as they're getting old in life, their bodies begin to to fail, and yet they just seem full of life, full of zeal, full of love, full of faith. That's what Jesus can do. That's what Jesus can do. And I love it when I see that, and it's so encouraging to me. A third application to our text this morning, though, is where we can't, Jesus can. And the reality is, in the text that we were just looking at, the wedding host was helpless to fix the situation. This could be my life, to be honest with you, as I think back on it. What it could have been had it not been for Jesus. I feel very comfortable telling you that. I shudder to think what my life would have been had Jesus not been there. Had Jesus not been there. And so in a very real way, I found this a perfect analogy for me. But because he was there in that wedding, because he was present with his disciples, they tasted the very best of the creator's grapes. They tasted the very best. And isn't this kind of the point Where we can't, Jesus can. And with the Lord, as John would say there in his prologue, there is grace upon grace. And lastly, as we think about this event, this wedding feast that they had been invited to, what a blessing it is to realize that we are invited to the feast. We are invited to dine with Jesus. Open your Bible as we close to Revelation chapter 19. In our text that we studied this morning, morning, embarrassment and disaster was averted because Jesus was there. And even though, as I just said a few moments ago, Jesus makes the earthly more pleasurable. And boy, I wish I could spend some more time on that. But the real joy, the real joy is found in knowing Jesus has invited us to the feast. Let's close with this thought. Revelation chapter 19, verse 9. Then he said to me, write, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these words, these are the true words of God. Brethren, I thank you so much for your kind attention this morning. I'm so blessed to be able to be with you. And may God bless you the rest of your day.